Now on your sermon notes, you will notice that the message this morning is titled Out of Line. And I think as we get into the text this morning, you're going to understand why I titled the message that way. My guess is that you have memories of people who crossed the line in your life. They were simply out of line with something that they did or or something that they said. I learned a hard lesson, um, a very hard way once when I was out in a shopping mall and I came upon this very uh, young gal pushing a stroller and she had the cutest little uh, cutie in her stroller, curly hair, really cute smile. And I, uh, I said, your little girl is so cute. To which she frowned at me and said, he's a boy, not a girl. Most people would know to leave well enough alone, but this young gal was wearing this this sundress. It was kind of tight around her belly. So I said to kind of make up for my gender faux pas, I I said, well, when are you due? (laughs) To which she frowned again and said, I'm not pregnant. And she quickly marched off, pushing her stroller. Uh, I felt really bad. I felt like a heel. I had crossed a line with this stranger that I did not even know. Um, In Amos' day, his ministry was to call Israel to get back in line with the will of God. He asked the question, well, was Amos' ministry a success? Well, the answer would be no, if you judge his ministry by the number of people who responded. But the answer would be yes, if you judge his ministry by his faithfulness to the call of God. A faithfulness, in fact, that caused many in Israel to accuse Amos of being out of line, as we'll see in just a moment. But Amos could do nothing else. He he had to speak about what it was that he had seen and what it was that he had heard. So as we begin today, I want to share a little bit of what it was that Amos saw and what it was that he he heard. Like many of the other prophets, God had given to Amos visions. In fact, he had five visions that he records in his message. Well, they're all in the last three chapters of the book. And today I'm just going to focus on four of them. And the first of them is found in the seventh chapter of Amos, beginning in the first verse. And this is what it says. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested. And just as the second crop was coming up, when they stripped the land clean, I cried out, sovereign Lord, forgive How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen, the Lord said. Now, he said it came after the king's share, which evidently was some form of taxation. And remember, the problem in Amos' day was a a lack of justice. So the first crop came in and the, the king and the rich and the powerful, they all would take the crop and line their proc. Pockets, And then the second crop comes up and that's when the common people were able to have their share people on the margins. So Amos says, Lord, what's going to happen in Israel if that second crop is destroyed by these locusts, by the way? And I think it's very important to realize this as a side note that the Old Testament prophets rarely get noticed for this side. You see, they are always ready to speak for God to the people, but they were just as ready to speak for the people to God. They really did care about the people that they ministered to. Even if they had to bring harsh messages of judgment, they did not do it with disdain. They did not do it with contempt. They did it with brokenness and sadness Because Amos loved these people, so he begs God, don't do this. So God relents. Well, the second vision is in the fourth chapter, or fourth verse of chapter 7. It says, this is what the sovereign Lord showed me. The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. 
Then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He's so small. So the Lord relented. This will not happen either, the Sovereign Lord said. Now, I think that the fire here that God speaks of probably was referring to invading armies back in chapter two, at least six times when God is judging the nations that are around Israel. He says that he is going to send fire. And in every single case, we know historically that those nations were invaded and they were crushed by other armies. So when God said he's going to send fire into Israel, he's probably referring to an invading army to deal with the wickedness of his people. Now notice again, Amos is begging God to stop and relent. And God does. Not because a king petitioned God, not because a court appointed priest spoke out, but because a country preacher prayed. And this illustrates a principle that I have shared before, but it's very important. Write this down. Sovereign God sovereignly chooses to run his universe in response to prayer. God has sovereignly chosen to have things happen or to not happen in response to what his people ask for. So Amos asked God and God responded because his intercession was in line with the will of God. And it allowed the nation of Israel that was out of line time to hear the word of the Lord And try to get back in line. But don't let it be missed that in both texts, it says that in response to Amos's intercession, that the Lord relented. It does not say that he forgave. In other words, the issue here is not whether God is going to deal with sin. The issue is when is God going to deal with sin? Because God's stance toward anything that is out of line with his character is unchangeable. Don't get the impression when you're reading through the Bible and you get into the Gospels that God is like capricious. And sometimes his anger just flares up. And some days God hates sin more than he does on other days. God's stance toward anything that is out of line with his character is unchangeable changeable. Now, it's true, God is patient when his children get out of line, but realize there would be no need for God to be patient if he was not vulnerable to provocation. You you don't need patience as an attribute if you are not capable of legitimate wrath. If God is not capable of anger, God would not need to be gracious. And Amos knows this. So God's decision to relent, which was a decision that Amos no doubt shared with the people of Israel, was a sovereign act of grace on God's part to motivate the nation of Israel to get back in line with the will of God. But Amos knew the God who relents is also the God who removes because God cannot ignore injustice. So look at the third vision with me beginning in the verse seven of chapter seven it says this is what he showed me the lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand and the lord asked me what do you see amos a plumb line i replied then the lord said look I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Now, if you're under the age of 30, you probably have no idea what a plumb line is. But I think it's very interesting and noteworthy that since the days of Amos and before, all the way to current times, that plumb lines are still in use today in building. They, they will hold a weight called a plumb bob up to a building or up to a wall. And the purpose of it is to discover the vertical correctness of something. 
I'm sure that Amos saw Foreman in his day many times holding up a plumb line. God says, Amos, I'm going to measure my people. And did you notice something? This time, Amos is silent. How can he object? How can he say, no, God, don't test your own people. Don't measure your own people. Amos already knows what this means, because if a wall is not plumb, if, if a wall is out of line, there's only one thing that you can do. You have to remove or take down that wall. You can't continue to build because to do so is going to put future people in jeopardy. If a wall is not in line, not only can it not do the job for which it is intended, but in the future, it can do great damage. And for the safety of future people, that wall has got to be removed. So God said, Amos, I'm going to put a plumb line in my people. I'm going to measure my people to see if they are in line with my will. And what can Amos say? Nothing. And his silence foreshadowed what was to come. The fourth vision is all the way in chapter 8, beginning in the first verse. We read these words. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. A basket of ripe fruit. What do you see, Amos? He asked. A basket of ripe fruit, I answered. Then the Lord said to me, the time is ripe for my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. In that day, declares the sovereign Lord, the songs in the temple will turn to wailing. Many, many bodies flung everywhere. Silence. Amos knew that Israel was ripe for judgment. And sadly, there is a, a, a powerful picture in the Hebrew that the English simply can't bring out. Because in the, in the Hebrew language, the word for ripe fruit it sounds exactly like the word in Hebrew for the end. And so Amos knew that when God said, what do you see, Amos? And he said, a basket of ripe fruit. He knew that what he really saw was the very end of Israel. Israel was plumb out of line. And their condition gives evidence, as much as I hate to admit this next point, but write this down. The ministry of the word does not always have its desired effect. Amos brought to Israel the clear, unadulterated, strong, bold word of God. And it bore no fruit. So again, you ask the question, well, was the ministry of Amos a success? Well, it depends on how you judge success. His ministry was faithful. So why wasn't it fruitful? And this is where I want to spend the, the rest of my time, because this is really the heart of what I want to share with you this morning, there's two things that I want you to notice that that come out of our text this morning. The first is this. Israel was thirsty for more of the world. The reason that Israel could not hear the word of the Lord was because their minds were preoccupied with other passions. Her real God was mammon. Her real religion was materialism. You go over to chapter 8 and you can see a stunning text where God brings charges against his people. And remember, Amos is not preaching to a people that did not go to church. The houses of worship in Israel were filled, particularly with the rich and the powerful. But notice what it is that God sees in their worship, beginning in the fourth verse, chapter 8. Hear this, you who trample the needy and do away with the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath be ended that we may market wheat? Skimping the measure, boosting the price, cheating with dishonest scales, buying the poor with silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, selling even the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, I will never forget anything they have done. Well, what is God saying? 
He's saying, you people don't fool me. Even though you go to church, I see everything that you are doing. You don't want to hear the sound of the trumpet that's calling everybody to come into worship. You want to hear the clanging of the bell announcing that the market is open so that you can go and make more money. Even in worship, your mind is on money. They were in the house of God saying, when is Sabbath going to be over? Does any of this sound familiar? Where do your minds wander when they wander during a church service? You see, they wander to whatever your passion is. And for many, this Sunday will not be a day of rest or refreshment. It will be a day of of worry and anxiety. They sit among the people of God thinking about what they need to do the next day to be able to make some more money. They want a church to be over so they could go and get back to the real world. You see, church was their hobby. Business and making money was their religion. And they saw no connection between their faith practices And the way that they practice their faith in the marketplace. And this disturbing duality caused them to see the people that they were ripping off, not as a brother or a sister, but as a financial loser. All that mattered was the bottom line. Because business is business, right? Whenever the bottom line is all that matters, you're out of line. With the will of God. In fact, they didn't want to hear any other line. You see, it wasn't just that they were thirsty for more of the world, but Israel was not hungry for more of the word. The Torah says that man does not live by bread alone. Israel said, yes, he does. And they wanted to hear preachers that would baptize their greed and bless their prosperity. They wanted to hear preachers that would say, God wants you to be rich. It's his will for your life. And your being rich is proof that God's favor and his hand are upon you. And that was the task of the established religion in Amos day. And the institution did its job well. Look at the difference between an institutional preacher and the real deal. Amos chapter 7, beginning in the 10th verse, we read, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there. Do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. In other words, We were doing just fine before you got here, fig picker. Nobody appointed you to preach God's word here. Go back to the country. Israel did not want to hear any word that would upset their status quo. So God decided to give Israel exactly what she wanted. See, they provoked God to silence. So in perhaps the greatest judgment that God has ever sent to his people, in verse 11 and 12 of chapter 8, we read these words. The days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, when I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. Men will stagger from sea to sea and wander from north to east, searching for the word of the Lord, but they're not going to find it. 
Now think with me for just a moment. What, what does that mean exactly? Does that mean that there would not be any more preaching in Israel? No, because Amaziah and all of his crew, they were preaching every week. It meant that there would be no word of God in the preaching because preaching is not a word from God unless God is in the word. And I just said a mouthful. Probably more than we can wrap our brain around. You can spend the rest of your life making religion a hobby and hearing a pre preaching and a sermon every single week and never hear a word from God. And in modern day America, it is particularly easy to do because God doesn't send a word to people who are preoccupied with all kinds of other passions. Israel's passion was for more treasure. And in the pursuit, they lost their greatest treasure. And so there was no more Amos or Micah or Isaiah or Hosea that came to arrive on the scene. No more prophets came to Samaria, not for one year, not for a decade, not for hundreds of years. In fact, the word of the Lord did not come again to Samaria for over 700 years. Until one day it was said of a young Jewish rabbi. Now he had to go through Samaria. And Jesus ends up asking a Samaritan woman for a drink as he sat beside this well. And before this woman knew it, Jesus had completely changed her passions. I told you last time that every single page of the Bible points to Jesus. Well, let me tell you what Jesus' mission includes. It includes getting my passions back in line. And I really want you to wrestle with this teaching today. How out of line are your passions? So I'm going to give you a test and only you can answer this. When your mind wanders, where does it wander to? Does it wander to your job? Does it wander to your hobby? Does it wander to your worries? Does it wander to God? I think that my struggle is your struggle. My mind often wanders to what it is that I want and to what I need and to what I think will make me happy and what I think would make my life better. My mind often wanders to the gifts instead of to the giver. John Piper said something that convicted me deeply. He writes... The critical question for our generation, for every generation, is this. If you could have heaven but no sickness, with all the friends that you ever had on earth and all the foods that you ever liked and all the leisure activities that you ever enjoyed and all the natural beauties that you ever saw and all the physical pleasures that you ever felt and no human conflict or any natural disaster... Could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ wasn't there? What is your passion? I believe the more in line our passions become, the more incredible our God becomes. And the more we find ourselves focusing on him. And in the book Prince Caspian by C.S. Lewis, little Lucy thinks that she has seen Aslan and her brothers and sisters have not seen him. And they're not convinced, but she knows she's seen him. And so she gets a chance to stand before the great Aslan, the Christ figure in the book. And, and she's confused and she says, Aslan, you're bigger. And the great lion replies, that's because you're older, little one. Every year you grow, 
you will find me bigger. And that is one of the reasons that we gather <coughs> to get our passions back in line so that, that God will become bigger and bigger in our lives, that he becomes our obsession. He becomes the one that our minds will just naturally tend to drift toward because this isn't our hobby. This is our life. 